financial supporters uh, who contribute uh, to this program. And in your program tonight, there is a small envelope if you would like to, to make a contribution of some kind to help support the program and make sure it continues in the years in the future. We thank you for that. Uh, there's also a survey in there. And uh, if you complete the survey, and we, we would collect on the way out of the auditorium, we'll select one of those surveys to get a free copy of the book, a free copy, signed copy of the book. So I encourage you to do that. Um, I also want to mention uh, some upcoming Writers of Books programs uh, that are going to be taking place this spring. One, uh, the first one is The Ladder, which is a one-day conference we do, and some of you may have attended last year. It's a conference for writers to help them advance their careers. And it's a day in which we bring in uh, editors and agents uh, and writers, uh, a lot of them from, from New York, but also from the West Coast and, and around the country, to help advise people, how do, you, how do you put a manuscript together? How do you sell it to an agent or to an editor? What are, what's the editing process going to be like, uh, et cetera? So that's going to be taking place uh, in early June. And uh, that is mentioned on the back of your program. And then another one which we've just started uh, this spring for the first time called Wednesday Night University, in which we have a number of speakers uh, from throughout the community who will be talking at Writers and Books on a number of different uh, literary uh, related topics of, of different kinds. And that is available information on that in our spring catalog, which is outside. Now, about uh, Rochester Reads, and, and, as Bunny mentioned, in our 19th year, from the very beginning, the intent of this program was to bring together people from throughout the community to share in a, a, a unique literary experience in which not only did they all read the same book, but as a result of reading that book, there were conversations that would take place uh, because you would have people in the same room who had never, ever been in the same room unless they had both had all read the same book. And We've always thought of the program as when you've done reading the book, you've just begun the conversation that grows out of it. And we've always tried to create uh, within that program books that do have topics that engender conversation, of ones that are important to people throughout the community. And uh, for those of you who have read the, uh, this year's book, you'll know that um, climate change is a very big part of that and what are the potential outcomes if we do not do something. And just in the past couple days, a couple of things I've, I've read in newspapers, seen which completely have to do with this and have raised my awareness of really looking out for things like this. So in yesterday's paper, there was an article about how the Great Lakes region of the United States in which we are, of course, living, is warming at a more rapid rate than any other part of the United States. What we can expect in the future is between 17 and 40 more days per year above 90 degrees. And we should expect think of it, uh, more days that are above freezing, but as a result, there's going to be much more uh, you know, violent changes in weather. We can expect extreme uh, flooding to take place in the, in the region also. And also I heard today um, about the introduction, supposedly in the Senate, of uh, a bill to, to deal with climate change, which was completely derided uh, by a number of senators who, who, you know, who poo pooed the idea that there was climate change, wanted nothing to do with discussing how we might deal with it. And all of that, as a writer uh, and as readers, when we read something like that in a book, it raises the questions, you know. What are our responsibilities, not only as readers of something like this, but as citizens? How does something we read translate into us having action that we get involved with as citizens? And uh, so that's one of the things I've really loved about this book, is the creation of awareness, among other things, of, uh, of climate change and what we can do with it. But another part of the book, which I think is significant, is that and in the interview that is in the Reader's Guide that you have, Omar mentions that we have the privilege in the West of ignoring what parts of the world we don't want to know about, what's happening in other parts of the world. 
in, in many cases, you know, wars going on, in many cases we're at least peripherally involved as, as being from the United States, and yet we have a tendency not to want to know. Um, and so we have a book here that turns that around and says, this is what it would be like if you were living in what is now many other parts of the world. So I think it's a book that genders a great conversation. Um, I hope that those conversations will continue and they're gonna be taking place here tonight. So let me introduce uh, Omar al Khad, who uh, was born in Egypt, spent his years growing up in Qatar, and then moved to Canada when he was 16 years old. Became uh, a journalist and as a journalist has been over the past 10 or 12 years, in many of the most recent uh, hot spots around the world, including the war in Afghanistan, military trials at Guantanamo Bay, the Arab Spring Revolution in Egypt, and Black Lives Matter protests in Ferguson, Missouri, all of which have combined as part of the background in informing this book and informing us as, as uh, readers. So it's my great privilege to introduce Omar al -Khad. How y'all doing? Good. I, can, I can work with that. Um, thank you so much for coming out to this. I, I really, really appreciate it. I'm, I'm grateful to Penfield Library and to Writers and Books for, for arranging this and to all of you for, for coming out. Um, I, I have, in fact, never given a talk at a gymnasium before. Uh, it's nice to be back uh, in a place where most of my most embarrassing high school moments do. A lot of flashbacks right now. Um, I rarely have a privilege to speak to, to an audience of this size, and, and whenever I'm in a situation where um, I have an audience like this, by which I mean uh, composed of more than just uh, family members that I badgered into attending, um, I'm always reminded of uh, the very first event that I did uh, as a published author. It was uh, literally the day the book came out, uh, April 4th, 2017, and it was a book club. And it was this book club that got the books in advance, so they had all read it, and they invite the author to speak at a restaurant themed after something in the book. And so this was in Toronto, uh, and they picked a southern barbecue place. Uh, Toronto, very well known for its southern barbecue place. <laughs> So I show up, I'm very, very nervous. I'm nervous all of the time, but I'm especially nervous on this day because it's my very first event. And I walk in, and the owner of the restaurant who's behind in the kitchen sees me and comes running over and brings his son, his, I believe, 12 year old son, and uh, runs over, shakes my hand, and says, your book is one of the best things I've ever read. And it changed my life. Uh, I wanted my son to meet you. I especially love the parts about time travel. <laughs> Very quickly became apparent that he was thinking of the previous month's book selection, which, uh, to add insult to injury, had been written by a close friend of mine, uh, Elon, who had gone on to sell it for an obscene sum of money. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm cognizant of, of how much of a privilege it is to be here with all of you, at least most of whom are aware of what book I've written. <laughs> um, that means quite a bit to me. Um, instead of just reading at you for, for 40 straight minutes, uh, I thought what I would do is talk a little bit about um, my experiences, uh, mostly as a journalist, that informed uh, American War. Um, before I waste your time with a giant synopsis, just a, a rough show of hands. How many people have read the book or are reading it? I will not waste your time with a synopsis. Uh, thank you, by the way. That's very kind of you. Um, so I, um, one of the really fun things you get to do when you're an author is you get to, after the fact, invent a very clean Genesis story for how the book came about. Um, this happened, and then this happened, and then I wrote a book. 
Uh, in reality, these are very messy things, and uh, it's not nearly that clean cut. But the closest thing I have to a Genesis story for this particular novel has to do, and this is a story I always start with, um, it has to do with this recollection I have from many years ago of watching this interview. Um, I don't remember if it was on CNN or one of the other news networks, but it was an interview with a foreign affairs expert, uh, one of these talking heads they bring in to sort of periodically explain the world. And it was taking place in the immediate aftermath of um, a set of protests that had happened in Afghanistan. Villagers were protesting against the US military presence. And the question that was put to this gentleman was something like, why do they hate us so much? And as part of his answer, he noted that sometimes the special forces have to go into these villages and conduct nighttime raids looking for insurgents. And that when they do this, they'll often ransack the houses or they'll hold the women and children at gunpoint. Uh, and then he very helpfully added, um, and you know in Afghan culture that sort of thing is considered very offensive. <laughs> I thought, you know, name me one culture on earth that wouldn't consider this sort of thing offensive. And that's when I first started thinking about this idea of, of taking the conflicts that have defined the world in my lifetime, so essentially the last 40 years, and these are conflicts in which U.S. involvement has either been indirect or from a great distance, and recasting them as something close to home. And I couldn't think of anything closer to home than a civil war where you're fighting yourself. The point of this being to get at the notion that there's no such thing as an exotic kind of suffering. That those folks all the way on the other side of the planet are not behaving in some kind of fundamentally foreign way to being on the losing end of a war or being on the receiving end of injustice. That we just happen to live in a part of the planet where we have the privilege to assume that. So in effect, this book that has the word American in the title is not a book I ever thought of as an American book or a book about America in any kind of literal sense. What I wanted to do was superimpose the stories of people who don't have much of a voice onto the part of the world that has the loudest voice. And so something I often go back to is this notion that if I had written this book 100 years ago, I probably would have called it British War. What matters is putting it in the heart of the dominant superpower. So I never intended it as a kind of prediction of, of how a literal second American Civil War would happen. Uh, nothing in this book is how I think that would happen. Instead, I intended it as sort of an allegory for the telling of a different kind of story. So I started writing the book in the summer of 2014. I finished the first draft almost exactly a year later, summer of 2015. And about three weeks after that, Donald Trump announced he was running for president. We sold the book, the book comes out four months into the beginning of the Trump administration. And as a result, this book that I intended to be a kind of allegory and the telling of a different story, instead is taken almost universally as a literal attempt at predicting how a second civil war in America would happen because this is where we're headed now. Um, and so I would constantly see it pop up on these lists of the first books of the Trump administration and the books you need to understand our current era and, and no matter how many times I would say that I swear the book was written before whatever this moment is happened, um, it didn't matter, it was taken in that way. Which has been great for book sales. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, the royalty statement is much higher than it otherwise would be. Um, but in terms of what I intended the book to be versus how it's been received, particularly in this country, there's a chasm between those two things. Um, I get asked a lot if, if this is what I think the future could be, um, and by definition I can't tell you if this is going to be anybody's future. Uh, I can tell you that it's very much based on somebody else's present. And so what I'd like to do is tell you some of that, some of those things that, that heavily influence the book. Some of my reporting assignments over the past 10 years, um, some of which influenced the book in a very superficial way, just the setting, the, the description of scenery, that sort of thing, and some in a much sort of deeper thematic way. Um, so I was born in Egypt, I grew up in a place called Qatar, which most people have never heard of, it's a little peninsula sticking out of Saudi Arabia. Um, pound for pound, maybe the richest place on earth. Uh, also a place where culture 
was when I was there, but also probably is today, heavily censored. Um, almost all the media I consumed came from somewhere else, usually America, American books, American movies, American TV shows, and was heavily censored. Um, I, have, I have no idea if, if how many people share my particular generational demographic, but I had copies of two Nirvana albums, uh, In Utro and Nevermind. Nevermind has the baby on the cover. The baby was blacked out, black ink. Uh, In Utro has the angel on the cover. The angel was blacked out. I still have those two albums. Um, it was that kind of environment. Um, one of my formative childhood experiences was holding up magazines to the light to try and see behind the black ink what was, what was deemed uh, too, too dangerous for me. Um, I came to Canada when I was 16. Um, I went to college in Canada, my degrees in computer science. I have no idea why. Um, I can't program my way out of a paper bag. It seemed like a good idea at the time. It was not. Um, all I've ever wanted to do with my life is write. And when I got to university, uh, I, I stopped going to class almost immediately um, because I was no good at it. And uh, very soon discovered a, a copy of the student newspaper that had an ad they were looking for, I think, assistant news editor. So I applied, I got the job, I spent the next four years working. My education was in the student newspaper. That's, um, that's where I spent essentially all of my time because I could write. Um, and it was liberating, it was very liberating. By the end of my time at, at Queen's University in Kingston up in Canada, uh, by the end of my time at university, I had built up enough of a portfolio that I could apply for internships at the, the major newspapers in Canada. Uh, and thank God for that, because I was never gonna get a job in computer science. Um, I got into the Globe and Mail, which is the national newspaper up in Canada. Um, I was hired as an intern, and then they kept me on as a 10-month contract. And finally, towards the very end of that contract, they said, fine, we're hiring you on full-time. So in the summer of 2006, I started full-time at the Globe and Mail as a city reporter. I started on a Monday, and on the Friday, we had the biggest terrorism arrests in Canadian history. Um, there was this case called the Toronto 18. It was 18 kids, and some of them were kids, some of them were 17, 18 years old. Um, who had these grand plans of storming Parliament Hill, beheading the Prime Minister. Um, none of it came to fruition. They were being watched the whole time. And on that Friday, the RCMP, which is our FBI in Canada, swoops in, arrests everybody. This becomes the biggest news story in the world for about a week, two weeks, and the biggest news story in Canada for about two years. Um, the first day, when they have the court hearings, CNN is there, the New York Times is there. It's still the busiest I've ever seen a courthouse in Canada. And we get beat on the story. The Globe and Mail gets beat on the first day. The other two major papers in Canada have full front page coverage, as they should. We have two paragraphs on A2, arrests made or something like that. We get beat so badly, um, you can look this up, we get beat so badly that the New York Times does a story on how badly we got beat. <laughs> There's literally a New York Times story about how badly the Globe and Mail fumbled the biggest story of the year in Canada. Um, in which my editor-in-chief is quoted as saying, I don't know. <laughs> Long story short, the, the next Monday, so this happens on a Friday, I believe, the following Monday, the editor-in-chief has an all-hands-on-deck meeting. It looks something like this. The editorial staff at the Globe and Mail, 300 people in a room, and he's looking around, and he's looking for anybody who has experience with Islam, because that's the religion that I think all of the, the, the suspects followed. He's looking for anybody with experience in the Middle East, so that's where some of these kids' parents came from. He's basically looking for brown people. And in a newsroom of 300, he finds two of us. He finds me, and he finds Kamal, the theater critic. <laughs> So he calls us over, and he says, you two, you're gonna to go to the mosques where these kids went, you're gonna do some street reporting, you're gonna to talk to people. Okay, this is what I do for a living. So I go to one of the mosques, Kamal, the theater critic, goes to the other mosque. We come back, I'm writing my file, Kamal sends me his file, and it's 500 of the most beautiful words I've ever read about the acoustics. <laughs> and the color of the velvet drapes 
because he's a theater critic who just happens to be brown. So anyway, I spent the next two years of my life on that story. I was on that case for literally two years, and a big part of it was spending time trying to understand how somebody goes from the most benign, suburban, North American upbringing in the suburbs of Toronto and Mississauga, how somebody goes from that to building detonators off of YouTube videos, what that process is like. And it was sort of a really fascinating education in, in the process of how somebody becomes radicalized. Um, and this book, in large part, is about how somebody becomes radicalized, is how that process takes place. One of the stories that sticks out in my mind from those two years has to do with um, the, the older men who were the mentors. So we quickly discovered there were two layers of, of this process. There were the younger guys who were all gung-ho about, you know, killing people and blowing stuff up. And then there were the older guys who were kind of mentors. They were like these elder figures. And I was hearing the story of one of these guys who, towards the very end, just before the, the arrests happened, took one of these kids out to the forests north of Toronto. And earlier in the day, he had gone out and he had dug a grave. He had dug a, basically a grave in the soil in the middle of nowhere. Later that evening, he takes one of these kids and he drives him down to this place, middle of nowhere, pitch black, and says, lie down in this grave. The kid lies down in the grave. And he looks at him and he says, this is where you're going to spend eternity if you don't commit martyrdom on behalf of your cause. And it was fascinating to me to hear that story because if I was trying to radicalize any of you, and I led with that, that was the beginning of my pitch, you would immediately tell me to go to hell. As would this kid if, if this mentor had done that. But this wasn't that. This was the end of a years long, gradual process of radicalization. That started years earlier with this guy saying something like, hey brother, did you hear about what they're doing to your brothers and sisters in Chechnya? Did you hear about what you're, they're doing to your brothers and sisters in Palestine? It started much, much more benign and very slowly and very gradually worked its way to the point where you could tell somebody to lie down in a grave and if they don't commit martyrdom, they're gonna spend eternity there and they believe you. Um, so a lot of the book's central narrative with respect to radicalization is informed by that very slow, deliberate, manipulative process that nonetheless needs to begin with some kind of truth at the beginning. There are horrible things being done to Muslims in Chechnya. And if you start with that, you can take someone to some really, really dark places. So that was the, the first major assignment I worked on as a reporter. Um, the following year, I had been agitating for a long time for the, the Globe to put me on their Afghanistan rotation. I really wanted, my, my, my central purpose as a journalist was to tell stories that if you didn't hear them from me, you weren't gonna hear them from anybody else. And, and many times in my journalistic career, I did the exact opposite. When I worked as a tech reporter and I would report on the new iPad, if you didn't hear about that from me, you're going to hear about it from the other 800 reporters who were at the, the iPad launch. But very quickly I gravitated towards foreign reporting and conflict reporting in particular. And so finally in, in late 2007, the foreign editor agreed to send me off. Um, first time I went to Afghanistan, I was 25 years old. I had read far too much Hemingway. Uh, I had a very romanticized image of the war correspondent as this heroic figure who dodges the bullets. And, um, it took about three days to realize that that was all nonsense. Um, one of the very first experiences that sticks out in my head from my time in Afghanistan had to do with the place I was in, the military base I was in. I was stationed for a while in Kandahar Airfield, which is this massive NATO facility in Kandahar, uh, the size of a small city. I think at the time when I was there, maybe 25,000 people were at this place. Uh, just a sea of shipping containers used as offices, uh, all kinds of tents, uh, a runway, um, there was a Burger King. Um, at one point we, we got out of the, the, the tents 
to the sound of this commotion going on from the boardwalk. The boardwalk was the center, central area of the, uh, of the base. So we go out to the boardwalk to see what's up, and it turned out that they'd flown in the Dallas Cowboys cheerleaders. <laughs> Easily one of the most surreal days of my life. Um, they, they come in by helicopter, they do a song and dance to rousing applause. They get back in the helicopter, they get the hell out of there. Um, just really weird, really weird. <laughs> So Ken Hirefield is, is protected by an inner wire and an outer wire. The inner wire protects the base proper, and then there's like a no man's land of barbed wire and giant concrete blocks, and then there's the outer wire. And the outer wire faces the highway, so it's the interface between the base and the rest of the, the province. The inner wire is protected by NATO soldiers. Westerners, state-of-the-art training, state-of-the-art equipment, state-of-the-art weapons, uh, armor, the rest of it. The outer wire protected by the Afghan troops. Uh, almost universally 17, 18 year olds, uh, no body armor, very little training, and uh, the weapons the Soviets left behind 30 years earlier. But by its nature, if there's ever an attack on this base, it's going to be against the outer wire. Uh, almost nobody gets in to the inner wire. And so this was structured very deliberately. The layout of this camp was structured very deliberately. And it was a great education in this notion that here we are, and we're all supposed to be on the same side, and we're all supposed to have this common enemy. And yet, even in this situation, there's a very real hierarchy of whose lives matter more than whose, of who's expendable and who isn't. That was my first experience that there was nothing to my notion of, of war being about the guns and the caliber of the bullets and all of that stuff that as a 25-year-old boy I was convinced was what war is. Um, a few days after, after we arrived, I ended up going to a, uh, what's called a FOB, a forward operating base. A forward operating base is, is basically a miniature version of Kandahar Airfield. So Kandahar Airfield, very big, very well protected. The forward operating base is out in the middle of nowhere, very small, very poorly protected. And as a result, they come under attack much, much more often than, than the, the big bases. So we end up at this place, the forward operating base at Masamgar. We show up, and they tell us that, I think for the previous 30 nights straight, that base had come under RPG fire. Somebody had shown up and fired a rocket into the space every night for the previous 30 nights in a row. And one of the things about this situation is um, these guys are also the insurgents, the Taliban, whatever you want to call them, they're also using the weapons the Soviets left behind. So these RPGs have no guidance mechanism. When they fire them in the middle of the night, they have no idea where they're going to land. They just sort of hope it hits something. And the forward operating base has these turrets on the side of the hill usually. And the turrets have machine, gun on, machine guns on them. And the machine guns, when anything is fired at the base, calculate the trajectory of these projectiles in real time, turn to the location where that fire must have come from, and immediately fire on that location. And all of that happens in about a second. Which means that every single night, for the past 30 days, every single person who showed up and fired one of these rockets was killed instantly. And yet, every subsequent night, somebody volunteered to show up and do the exact same thing again. And these folks, for all their ideology and for all their evil, are not dumb. They know exactly how this was going to end. And yet, they volunteered every single night. So we're at the base and we're walking back that night from the mess hall where we'd had dinner to the sleeping quarters. It's pitch black, and suddenly we hear this whistling noise in the air. Um, a few months earlier, the Globe and Mail had sent uh, myself and a couple of other reporters to what's called hazardous environment training. It's basically war correspondent training. The insurance companies won't let them send reporters to war zones without going through that training. And what it entails is basically you go to a farm in Virginia, and a bunch of former Special Forces guys from the British Special Forces uh, simulate explosives around you, and um, they teach you combat first aid. Uh, combat first aid basically boils down to, no matter what it is, 
uh, tie a tourniquet around it and run. That's, I, I just saved you a few thousand dollars worth of combat first aid training. Um, wait, I mean, I'm, I'm being flippant about it, but it, it actually saves a lot of lives, um, this training. Anyway, one of the things that they taught us is when you hear this whistling noise, you do a certain number of things very quickly. You drop to the ground, you cover your ears, you try to point your direction, your feet in the direction that you think this thing is going to land in, and then you breathe out. And one of the reasons you breathe out is because the first thing that kills when an explosive goes off, something like an RPG, is not the shrapnel, it's the overpressure wave. It's just forced air. Air gets forced outward very, very quickly, and if it hits your lungs and your lungs are full, it could kill you. So fast forward, a few months later, we're walking, we hear the whistling noise, and I do all of those things. I drop down to the ground, I cover my ears, I point my feet in some direction because I have no idea where this thing is going to land, I breathe out, and then what happens next is just dumb luck. It landed over there instead of over here. Nothing I would have done, nothing I did would have made any difference if it had landed over here. Um, and then I look up at the sky and immediately there's just this incredible loud gunfire, essentially. It's this incredibly loud volume. Uh, and the sky looks like the inside of a disco, because every few rounds there's a tracer around, and so it's these red lines streaking through the air. And this lasts for about five minutes. Um, most of my experiences covering war are basically very long periods of complete boredom, punctuated by these very short bursts of the exact opposite, of chaos. And it was really, really hard to find yourself in that situation, come out of it, and still think of this entire enterprise as having a rational beginning, a rational end, and some kind of rational winning conditions. And I think like most people, I like to think of wars as things that we fight out of necessity when we have to. And then when we do fight them, we have very, a very good idea of why we're doing it, and what it takes to win. And yet to be in that situation and to see this, this sort of Groundhog Day kind of thing where people go and they know they're going to get killed and they do it anyway, there was no sense of rationality about any of it. The overwhelming sense for me was of a kind of cyclical absurdity, an irrational endlessness to it all. Um, and so I bring all of this up because American War is a very overtly violent book. And I know it makes me sound like a hypocrite to say this, but I don't like violent anything. I don't like violent books, I don't like violent movies. Um, but there were certain things that I had to stay true to when I was writing this book. To write this particular book, there were things I couldn't shy away from. And one of them is that absurd cyclical violence in which it feels like nobody's getting anywhere. Um, that overwhelmingly was my experience of, of Afghanistan. Um, I spent 2007 and 2009, uh, those were my two stints, late 2007, late 2009, were my two stints in Afghanistan. The year in between, I spent going back and forth to the other central location in the War on Terror, which is the Guantanamo Bay um, detention camps. Um, Afghanistan was an education on the physical violence of wartime. Guantanamo was an education on every other kind of violence in wartime. Uh, linguistic violence, bureaucratic violence, the, the violence of euphemism, the violence of censorship. All of that was readily apparent when you end up in a place like Guantanamo Bay. Um, for the vast majority of its life, Guantanamo Bay was this marine base that nobody cared about. Uh, every now and then they intercepted a migrant ship, but otherwise nobody really paid much attention to it. And then almost overnight, it becomes the central detention location for what are considered the worst of the worst. People who are so bad that they need to come up with new terms for them. Uh, they're now unlawful enemy combatants. Um, and so what happened was, the folks at Gitmo had to very quickly design a brand new system of doing everything. They had to build a new detention facility, 
They had to build a new legal system on top of that, and they had to build a new system of talking about all of that. And all of this was done in a hurry. So if you ever see the pictures of Guantanamo Bay, the iconic photos of the Guantanamo Bay detention camp, is this thing that looks like an oversized dog kennel. It's this chain link fence kind of thing. And the person inside wearing the orange jumpsuit. Um, that's photo, those, those are the photos taken from Camp X-Ray. Camp X-Ray was built very, very quickly as a stopgap measure because the planes were coming in from Afghanistan and they needed to put these folks somewhere. They tore it down very, very quickly, but the images from Camp X-Ray remain the iconic images of that detention camp. To the point where, if you ever watch the, um, any ISIS sort of hostage videos, the reason they make the hostage wear the orange jumpsuit is a direct reference to those photos. That lasted not very long. Then they moved them to more permanent facilities, camps one, two, and three. Uh, a bunch of people killed themselves in camps one, two, and three. They moved everybody to camps four, five, and six. Four is a medium security. Five and six are super max. Um, so we went and we saw these places. And very quickly, I got the sense that this was the first place I'd ever been to that could accurately be described as Kafkaesque. It is a strange, a very strange place where um, almost everything exists in close proximity to its exact opposite. You have these brutal looking detention camps down the street from the officer's suburbs that look like any upper middle class suburbs you've ever seen in your life. They have the playgrounds, they have the kids running to school. And so we're touring, we're touring Camp 4, and very quickly I got my first experience of these other kinds of violence, um, namely the linguistic violence. So we're walking through Camp 4. Camp 4 is a um, medium security facility, and it's, that means you get certain perks if you're there, what they call comfort items. So for example, you get uh, pens. They're made, they're rubbery, so that you can't stab people with them. Uh, you get nightshades, which are really important because the lights never go off in Camp 4, and so if you want to sleep, it's really helpful. Um, you get prayer beads. There are stickers on the ground that point in the direction of Mecca, because overwhelmingly the prisoners are Muslim, and if you pray in Islam, you're supposed to face Mecca. And so those stickers are very helpful. But more than any of that, you get communal living. You get to see other people. That's the chief perk. Um, and it is handed out to uh, what are called highly compliant. If you're a compliant prisoner, meaning if you talked during inter interrogation, you get camp four. If you don't play along, you get camps five and six, which are super max facilities. Um, 23 hours a day, 23 and a half hours a day in isolation cells. Um, spot checks every few seconds. There's soldiers walking up and down the hallways looking through the slits in the doorway, um, checking to make sure you're not doing anything you shouldn't be. So we're touring Camp 4, and at one point I ask one of the soldiers a question. I say something like, um, well, what about the prisoners? And as soon as I get to the word prisoners, he stops me. And he says, we don't have prisoners here, sir. We have detainees. And there's a very real reason for that, um, for using that language. Uh, a prisoner implies a prison sentence, which by definition has to be defined. Even a life sentence has to be defined. A detainee you can hold forever. Um, and this was from the same school of, of, of sort of euphemism as um, unlawful enemy combatant, as opposed to we don't want the Geneva Conventions to apply to this person, or um, enhanced interrogation instead of torture, or uh, collateral damage instead of we accidentally bombed a wedding. Um, that was a really important component of making this thing work. You needed the language to justify everything on which the language rests, the, the legal system, the detention system. One of my defining stories from Guantanamo Bay has to do with um, one of the court hearings we were at. Um, usually at the end of court hearings, the way it works is uh, the judge would be over here, the defense is over there, the prosecution's over there, all of these people are from the military, the defense lawyer, the prosecution, the judge are all military. Um, and then in the back of the room, behind one-way glass, um, same kind of thing, if you ever watch Law and Order, there's the interrogation room and then there's the one-way glass and people behind it, that's where the media would be. The media would be behind this glass, 
and we would get um, uh, a separate audio feed on a 10 second delay. And the reason for that is, if at any point the judge, somebody said something that the judge deemed classified, the judge could hit a mute button and we just would get silence in the back of the room. They needed to do this because the rules were so new and so ad hoc that nobody was really clear on what was classified and what wasn't. At one point, the lawyer for one of the, the, the prisoners accidentally said the name of a classified witness six times in a row. He was supposed to say Colonel M or something like that. And instead he kept saying you know, Colonel Morris or whatever his name was. And the judge kept correcting him. And finally the judge said, if you do that again, I'm gonna hold you in contempt. Um, but he kept making the mistake. And this is a Navy lawyer. This isn't somebody they brought in from the outside. This is someone who's familiar with the rules. But because this particular set of rules was so new, he kept making that mistake. Um, and you would see this all of the time. You would see a brand new system, poorly thought out, do exactly what you would expect a brand new system to do. So anyway, at the end of the hearings, we would usually get the court documents, we would get copies of any motions that were filed in that hearing. And we got used to getting these pieces of paper that would be mostly black lines. It very much reminded me of my upbringing in Qatar and the sort of censored, hold it up to the light kind of thing. By that point, they'd figured out better ways to do it. They do it on PDF, and then they scribble over it and do it again so you can't hold it to the light. But anyway, it's not important. Um, we got used to this thing where you would get you know, entire paragraphs where the only word that wasn't blacked out was the, or he, or then, you know, something like that. So anyway, we get one of these motions, and we're looking through it, and it's censored, censored. And we get to the back, and in the back there's something called Appendix A. And we look at Appendix A, same thing, censored pretty much almost all the way through. Except Appendix A was a copy of a New York Times article that the defense lawyer had referenced in the motion and decided to make life easier for the judge by just including at the end. So immediately, every journalist gets up, runs to their computer, brings up the New York Times website, and you can immediately tell exactly what it is the military has deemed too dangerous for you to read. And at no point in this process did anybody along the chain of command say, hey, what the hell are we doing here? Why are we censoring an article that's also available on the most popular news website on Earth? <laughs> Nobody. Because that's what it had to be. The system has to justify itself. And so a lot of American war is based on that. A lot of American war, once you take aside the overt violence, there's all these other layers of violence um, that has to do with what happens when a bureaucracy wants to do something that it secretly knows it probably shouldn't do, and all the ways in which systems are put in place to justify that process. Um, for a long time, I was, I started writing the book and I knew what the narrative arc would be. I knew how it was gonna end and I knew how I was gonna get there, but I didn't know where to start it. And uh, that was until I finally got a chance to do this story that I'd been pitching for a long time which was a story about climate change in southern Louisiana. Um, if anybody here has ever been to southern Louisiana, it's one of the most beautiful places on Earth. It's just geographically unique and gorgeous and also disappearing at the rate of a football field of land every hour. That is the rate at which southernmost Louisiana is vanishing into the Gulf of Mexico. Um, it's maybe the worst climate change disaster ongoing in America, and it gets very, very little coverage. There's a whole number of reasons why this is happening. Uh, climate change, rising sea levels, um, saltwater intrusion. The saltwater gets in, kills the root systems of the plants that are holding the land together, so it makes the land more brittle. Um, there's hundreds of miles of oil and gas pipelines that have been laid over the years, some of which were put up um, so long ago that they don't know where they are anymore, so they're just off quietly leaking somewhere. Um, Normally the river itself would, would counteract some of this because the river left to its own devices would move east and west over, over the decades, the centuries. And where it would move, it would replenish sediment. It would help create land. But in order to save cities like New Orleans, 
the river has been levied in place. So now it doesn't move anymore. So one intrusion that was done with the best of intentions to save one aspect of the place um, from ruinous nature has resulted in an in a arguably much worse longer term consequence that nobody thought of. Um, and as soon as I got to southern Louisiana, um, I, I realized that this is the place where the novel needed to begin. Um, I said earlier that I don't think of this as a, as a novel about America, but it is in many ways concerned with things that America has done to and in the world. And since it's a book that's also so concerned with inversion, it seemed fitting to start it in a place where the world was doing something to America. Um, there's no doubt in my mind that this is going to be the central crisis of the next hundred years. Um, and it's a crisis that has absolutely no respect for national borders. It's not going to respect the sovereignty of a state, no matter how powerful. All of that stuff is out the window. Um, and that, that was the reason I needed to start the book in Louisiana. Um, it is customary at these things, I am told, uh, to do a reading from the book. Um, I will give you two warnings. One is that I'm not a particularly good reader. Um, the other is that, um, as the New York Times Review helpfully noted, this is a very convoluted book, um, which means that if I try to read from anywhere other than the beginning, I have to spend half an hour explaining what the hell is going on. Although it now occurs to me that people have read this. I don't have to do that. Um, nonetheless, for the benefit of my very long-suffering interpreters who are aware of which section I'm going to read, um, I'm just going to do this from the very beginning. This is pretty well from the start of chapter one. <clears throat> the sun broke through a pilgrimage of clouds and cast its unblinking eye upon the Mississippi Sea. The coastal waters were brown and still. The sea's mouth opened wide over ruined marshland and every year grew wider, the water picking away at the silt and sand and clay until the old riverside plantations and plastics factories and marine railways became unstable. Before the buildings slid into the water for good, they were stripped of their usable parts by the Delta's last holdout residents. The water swallowed the land. To the southeast, the once glorious city of New Orleans became a well within the walls of its levees, the baptismal rites of a new America. A little girl, six years old, sat on the porch of her family's home under a clapboard awning. She held a plastic container of honey, which was made in the shape of a bear. From the top of its head, golden liquid slid out onto the cheap pine floorboard. The girl poured the honey into the wood's deep knots and watched the serpentine manner in which the liquid took to the contours of its new surroundings. This is her earliest memory, the moment she begins. And this is how, in those moments when the bitterness subsides, I choose to remember her, a child. I wish I had known her then, in those years when she was still unbroken. Sarah Chestnut, what do you think you're doing, said the girl's mother, standing behind her near the door of the shipping container in which, in which the chestnuts made their home. What did I tell you about wasting what's not yours to waste? Sorry, Mom. Did you work to buy that honey? No, I don't think you did. Go get your sister and get your butt to breakfast before your daddy leaves. Okay, Mama, the girl said, handing back the half-empty container. She ducked past her mother, who patted dirt from the seat of her fleur de -lis dress. Her name was Sarah T. Chestnut, but she called herself Surratt. The latter was born of a misunderstanding at the schoolhouse earlier that year. The new kindergarten teacher accidentally read the girl's middle initial as the last letter of her first name, Surratt. To the little girl's ears, the new name had a bite to it. Sarah ended with an impotent exhale, a fading awe that disappeared into the air. Surratt snapped shut like a bear trap. A few months later, the school shut down, most of the teachers and students forced northward by the encroaching war, but the name stuck, Surratt. And with that, my clock tells me I've been talking at you for 42 straight minutes. Um, thank you so much for your patience. I'm more than happy to take questions or comments. <laughs>
are we doing hands or are we doing mics? Okay, the mic is on its way. Trying to think of a story to regale you with that doesn't last for another 30 minutes, but most stories have many tangents. Thank you very much. That's very kind. You set the expectations low, and that if you if you supersede those, it's great. Um, so yeah. So. Um, it, it seems that your objective was to turn the tables between the Middle East and the people in America. Um, and I was actually just wondering, I mean, a big part of um, the relationship between us and people in the Middle East is the occupation of the soldiers in the other countries. And I was wondering if you gave any thought to uh, occupation of the Middle Eastern people in the United States in your book, and if so, why you decided not to have them occupying and just pulling strings instead? That's a really interesting question. Thank you for that. I, um, so, so yeah, the book is, is very much this process of inversion. But it wasn't inversion so much with the Middle East specifically in mind. I created this new empire in the Middle East based on this hopelessly optimistic vision for where, you know, after five springs we get to uh, a, a new democratic empire. Um, but one of the things about that empire is that it doesn't live free of the consequences of its previous decisions. Huge swaths of the area are now uninhabitable, they're too hot, they're just fields of solar panels. Um, when I was thinking about the way to invert that relationship, I was less concerned with the, the kinetic part of warfare. I was less concerned with, you know, soldiers with guns showing up and the kind of, um, what was that terrible movie in the 80s where the Russians occupy America? It was Red Dawn, that was it, Red Dawn. I was less concerned with the Red Dawn model. Um, and then they made it again and it was still terrible. Um, I was thinking much more of something like um, US involvement during the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, where you see the rival superpower, it's in a quagmire, and you're going to quietly prolong that in whatever way you can. Maybe by selling Stinger missiles to the Mujahideen. And if uh, a few decades later that turns out to have been a really bad idea, well, that's somebody else's problem. I was much more concerned with that kind of insidious um, under the table, as opposed to the big, oh, they're here with guns kind of thing. Which is, yes, in places like Iraq, of course, um, that's how it works. But also, I come from a part of the world where a bunch, you know, 100 years ago, a bunch of British and French guys just drew some lines on the map. And as a result, we have Lebanon, a place that really, culturally, should not exist as a nation as it is. It has laws in place where the president has to be of a certain religion and the prime minister has to be of a different religion to appease all of the, the demographics that were rounded up by a bunch of British and French people into this arbitrarily created thing. Yeah, there were guns and people with guns involved, but the really insidious stuff was done from a much quieter, much more quote-unquote civilized kind of place. That's what I was concerned with, rather than the, the gun stuff. Yeah, I can be pretty loud. Uh, my question, you've answered so many of the thematic questions that I don't feel like I want to I wanted to ask maybe a writing question. Sure. Um, uh, point of view, my question about point of view, it seemed like there were many different points of view. We kind of have an omniscient narrator in some spots. We have the first person of the, the Giannis Benjamin. And what we have a lot through Sarata is, um, I just wondered if you mapped that out or you let it flow and try to figure it out later. How did you write the book and decide on the point of view? Yeah, thank you for that. It's a very convoluted setup. It's technically first person, but a huge portion of the book is essentially third person. Also, there's source documents in the middle that kind of inform the telling of it. It's, it's, there's a lot of moving parts to it. Um, the part I was most concerned about was the notion of having it be told from the point of view, the overarching point of view, of somebody who, who had been affected by the events but couldn't change any of it. It was too late to actually do anything about any of this. And so that's why it's from the point of view of, of the nephew. 
One of the strange things about the reviews is that almost all the reviews would say things like, I don't want to spoil what happens at the end. And I would think, well, I spoil what happens at the end about 20 pages in. It becomes pretty clear what's going to happen. It's not. And the thing I really didn't want to spoil, which is the identity of, of the narrator, was spoiled in every review. It would be like, told from the point of view of her nephew. And it, um, that, was, that was a frustrating thing to deal with. But what I wanted more than anything was, was to, to have the narrator have to wrestle with a lack of agency. So much of the book is about this notion of what happens when you take away somebody's agency. Your very basic desire to have a say over the things you do and the things that are done to you. And so the bulk of the book is about a person who, in the, halfway through the book there's this line where somebody says you fight the war with guns, you fight the peace with stories. The bulk of the book is about somebody who decided to fight the war with guns. And then it's told from the point of view of somebody who, stripped of agency in a different way, decides to fight the peace with stories. And that's why the book concludes with this incredibly futile, impotent act of this guy burning her diaries even though it would do nothing at all. It's, he says, it's the last way I have to hurt her, or something like that. The, that's the reason the point of view was constructed the way it was more than anything else. Um, we had to go through a lot of rewrites to make that work because that's a really convoluted way to set up a story that probably could have just been done as a straightforward story of a person. Sorry, sir. The, the name you chose, Chestnut, for the last name, is that a reference to Mary Chestnut, the Civil War Diaries? It is, uh, both Surratt and Chestnut. Um, so it's the two Marys of the Civil War, Mary Surratt and Mary Chestnut. Uh, both of those last names are spelled differently, I believe, in, the, in this book. Uh, one is a diarist, uh, and the other, I believe, is the only woman indicted as part of the conspiracy to assassinate Lincoln. So a would-be assassin and a diarist. I like that combination. So that's where Sarah and Chestnut comes from. The thing about Sarah T. Chestnut and the T coming as part of the name, uh, I stole that from, I believe it was Ulysses S. Grant. I don't think the S stands for anything. I think it was a typo at some point. And he was polite, so he went with it. I'm not 100% sure, but I sort of stole that and, and used that as well. But yes, it's, it's the two Marys and so on. Oh, okay. Um, thank you. you. You answered a lot of my questions in your talk, um, but I wanted to ask, so there was a spot that I dog-eared in the book where, you, where um, it says, what was safety anyway but the sound of a bomb falling on someone else's home? And um, I wanted to ask you as a journalist, you know, we're, from your perspective, we as Americans, we live in safety, but there's, you know, the, the nature of the news cycle is there's always something new, a new story, and, um, you know, I, I personally feel overwhelmed by the things that happen around us and the things that I can't control, and um, I was just wondering um, if, as a journalist, writing the different stories, if you feel like, geez, I wish I could focus on this longer, but now i got to go on to that, or, and what advice would you have for us when we're kind of saturated and then we feel like, well, it's not happening to me, so that's sad, but okay, i got to go to work now and live my life, you know? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a really interesting and really fundamental question, and, and I've been thinking about it a lot because the first time I approached this was as a journalist. And as a journalist at the newspaper, we used to have the saying where, say, you know, the media doesn't tell you what to think. It tells you what to think about. And so we throw something on, on the front page, we're going to get people to think about it, but we can't tell them how to think. Um, that's a little different for the really ideologically driven, you know, the Fox News of the world is a, is a different thing altogether. But for the most part, what you're really doing is shining a spotlight. And after that, um, you know, there have been some really incredible investigations into um, the carnage that the war in Yemen is causing. Right? And people risk their lives to do that journalism. And I don't think it's fair to add a layer on top of that that, that then holds them responsible for whether people care or not. Um, that is not a conversation that, that the journalist has with the person. 
That's a conversation the person, the person has with their own conscience. And so all you can really do is get this out there. That is the purpose of journalism. Beyond that, there's something much deeper at a societal level that needs to be addressed. There's good journalism being done all over the place. There's horrendous journalism being done. And, and usually it's done in the, in the... My shorthand for it is if you ever watch something and it's blah blah with blah blah, and the person's name is way bigger than the name of the program, you're probably watching some pretty bad journalism, right? The, the AP bureau chief writing out of Nepal, most people don't know that person's name, right? And they're doing really good journalism, and they're not getting millions of dollars for it. Um, I can only really lay the, the sort of fundamental prerequisite. I don't have the answer to your question. I have the sort of basic minimum requirement, which is to think of those people as human beings. Um, which sounds like a really trite thing to talk about, but I spend a lot of my time trying to get this notion of, of explaining to one group of human beings that another group of human beings are in fact human beings. And so I would get to this place where, and, and I don't mean this as, you know, I'm constantly talking to malicious, racist people. I'm talking to people who would ask me things like, well, what should we do about the war in Syria? And I would say, well, I'm not a geopolitics expert. I don't, I don't have the answers. But maybe as a start, pretend that it was happening in California or pretend that it was happening to people who look and sound like you. I bet you'll get a lot more creative with your range of answers. And I got so tired of going down that road that I wrote a whole damn book, basically, <laughs> advocating the same theory. Beyond that notion, I don't know, that is a conversation a person needs to have with their own conscience. Other than tell people what is happening, I don't know what more journalists can do. Um, I wanted to ask about Surratt specifically because I found it interesting that even from the time she was a small child when we first meet her, um, her size is always really something that's discussed. So she can't get clothes to fit her. She's 6'5 by the end of the book. And so I wondered if you had the idea that she had a syndrome of some type or if it was just that um, you wanted her physically to stand out and be kind of outgrouped based just on physicality. Thank you for that question. I had a couple of reasons in mind, um, one of which had to do with some of the physical changes that I've seen in people who are held in captivity. Uh, so the notion that you sit in an isolation cell and every once in a while food comes in through a tray uh, and that's pretty well all that happens and you sit there and you undergo physical changes that mirror the psychological changes that you go through. Um, also, as Surat as a human being, I. One of her defining qualities when I, was, when I was thinking of this character and I was spending time with her is this notion of being removed from her surroundings, of feeling somewhat unanchored, um, which is the only thing I think she has in common with me. Um, she's certainly much smarter than me and she's much more curious and I don't think she'd like me if we ever met. Uh, but, it's, but we have this, this, this sense of, of not exactly knowing where you belong in the world. Yeah, I'm one of those people who doesn't have a very good answer to the question, where are you from? I was born in one place, I grew up in another, a citizen of the third country, now I live in the fourth. And that was central to me describing her across the board. So that was one element of it. The other was my own failing as a writer, which is to say one of the tendencies I have as a writer, and I've been working to address this, is that I spend a lot of time describing the physical characteristics of the places I'm interested in and the people I'm interested in. But that's not an apolitical thing. And I can't go around and say, well, I would do it for every character if I spent this much time. And one of the things that happens when you first pick up this book is that very quickly, you are given physical descriptions of, of the central character. Um, and because it happens so quickly in the book, it becomes this kind of central foundational thing. And I was, I was thinking about that in hindsight, about what that means, and the depth of thought that went into it, and the extent to which I should have thought much more deeply about what it means when you describe the physical body of a human being, particularly a woman, to begin a novel. It was always in my head that this human being would not look like people around her, and that she would undergo a particularly sharp transformation the more she was held in captivity, and the more she was confined the more she was physically, emotionally, and psychologically confined. So that was a big part of the process. I don't know that I would do it the same way if I wrote this book today. 
I genuinely don't know. It might be that I think about it really, really deeply, and I come to the conclusion that the way I frame it in this book is exactly the way I should have done it, but it was the depth of thought that mattered, and that wasn't there. All there was was this notion of, this person is going to look physically different from everybody else because I want to highlight her alienation and her, her rootlessness, and also I want to mirror the kind of changes I saw physically in people in captivity. I don't think that was enough in terms of thinking about it. And that's one of the things, I mean, you're constantly thinking about these things in hindsight. You know, as soon as you publish the novel, you plant this flag, and time moves on, and you move on. And that, more than almost any other question, comes up to me, and I, I, it comes back, which is why I'm particularly displeased that I don't have a good answer for you, and that I've just rambled at you for a while. I do apologize for that, but that's the closest I can come to addressing it. Something else about Sarai, I think, that I um, I wondered uh, who she was to you because she almost seemed like a concept more than a person. Uh, a, a, such a ruthless warrior and an assassin and I just wondered who she was to you. She was this person who, when she first showed up, you know, her defining characteristics were curiosity, an endless curiosity but also an endless sense of trust. Those were the two defining characteristics that when she arrived, she had them. And so when you first meet her in the, in the novel, you have this person who's deeply curious about the world, but also believes the things she is told about the world. And the central arc of the book and the sort of central tragedy of the book is how that circle of trust closes in every time she's subjected to damage. Um, so at first, the circle of trust encompasses essentially everyone. And then it closes in to encompass only her family, and then certain members of her family. And finally, by the end of the book, the only thing it really encompasses is her own sense of revenge. So she's no longer really a partisan or a patriot of any cause. She's a nihilist. Um, I didn't want to create a character that by the end of the book you would apologize for, or sympathize with, or even really like. All I wanted was to create a character that you would understand how they got to the place where they got to. I mean, when we talk about radicalization or extremism, we almost always talk about it at the finish line, when this person's done whatever horrible thing they're gonna be remembered for. We very rarely talk about the rest of the race. Um, and that is what Surratt's life represents in this book, is the rest of the race. I, I, I lived with her a long time, um, the years, thinking about this book and researching it and then writing it and then rewriting it. And the person she is by the end of the book is someone I love dearly but don't like. And that's a strange relationship to have with anybody, fictional or otherwise. Um, and I was never concerned about making her likable. Um, you know, I get to ask the question about, well, what, what did she need? What, did, what, what, what could she have, you know, what, if she had gotten this, it would have been okay, what's this? And this is just the most straightforward answer in the world, right? What anyone in this room or in this world wants. Love, a sense of safety, someone to listen to you, a sense of agency over your own life. She's not special in that regard. Um, the extent to which she becomes a warrior or she, which she becomes ruthlessness is always in direct relationship to the magnitude of the damage inflicted upon her. And that, and how it's read by the, by the, by the reader, is almost always going to be through the prism of your own experience. Um, you know, I, I, I often get uh, questions or comments or criticisms about the, the kind of brutality in the book, and that's perfectly valid. I once did a book, uh, a Skype meeting with an Egyptian book group that um, once they realized that the massacre in Camp Patience was based on, on a, a real-life massacre in a Lebanese refugee camp, started berating me for toning it down in the book. And so you read these things through through the sort of personal prism of your experiences, which is not an invalid thing. Um, but that's always how I think about her ruthlessness or her, the extent to which she's a warrior, uncaring. It is relative to people's personal experiences of that sort of thing. I was just wondering if you um, have sold the rights to your book and we're going to be seeing it on big screen and perhaps what you're working on next. Uh, yes, maybe something. 
Uh, we're still in the works. Not sure it's ever going to get made into a movie, and I am working on something. I, uh, so the, the way I found out that my, my novel was on Amazon, uh, Amazon scrapes the I, ISBN numbers. As soon as you get a little identifying number of your book, it shows up on a placeholder page in Amazon. Usually it doesn't even have a cover image or a description, it's just this tiny synopsis. And all the big studios have these guys called scouts, and the scouts basically just hit refresh on Amazon, and they look for new stuff that's come up. So I found out my book was on Amazon because somebody emailed from Fox saying, hey, I saw the synopsis of this book, sounds like it would make a great movie if you sold the rights. Um, the thing about Hollywood is that they never read the books, like universally, they, they read the little synopsis, and the synopsis of this book makes it sound like it would be a really great movie, in like sort of a Hunger Games kind of vein. Uh, so I got a lot of sort of early interest, and then they went and read the book, and then they all ran for the hills, but um, it ended up with three bids, and we ended up going with one uh, company that has made a lot of work that I admire. Um, because I knew nothing about that world, I, I didn't know what to ask for. At one point, my, we got a second agent. I have a literary agent. She hired a film agent. So now the film agent is asking me, well, do you want to ask for an executive producer credit? I said, I have one follow-up question. What the hell is an executive producer credit? What does it mean? I don't... So I asked for, I asked for two things. I asked um, that they not tone it down, uh, that they not Disneyfy it or, you know, turn, turn it into American peace. And I asked uh, that they respect the racial backgrounds of the characters. And that, both requests, but the second request in particular caused a bunch of them to walk away. And they were very clear cut about it, you know. Where's the Tom Hanks role? Where's that kind of thing? They were very clear cut about that sort of stuff. So we sold the option, there's a, there's a screenplay floating around, um, but 95% of options never get exercised because there's this difference between paying you know, a few thousand bucks for the rights versus raising a hundred million dollars to make a movie. So a lot of these things just sit on the shelf until the option period expires and then you get it back and do the whole process over again. Um, so I have no idea if it's gonna actually ever get made. Um, I hope it does because I get paid a ton of money. <laughs> First day the cameras roll, I get upset for like 10 years. Um, I, uh, as, as for what's next, um, I, I recently finished what I hope will be the next manuscript, but it's one of those things where if it ever sees the light of day, you can almost put on the front, like, if you loved American War, you're gonna hate this thing. It's a very different book. Uh, it's much quieter, it's much shorter. It's not even set in an analogous America or any kind of America. It's contemporary, and I have no idea if it'll ever go out or if it'll alienate what, what readers I do have. But it was a thing I wanted to write, so uh, it exists, and it'll go through another 12 drafts, and we'll see what happens. Um, sorry, we have people over here. Feel free, go for it. That better. <laughs> um, I've heard some people say that they assumed that Surratt was white, and I actually had the sort of opposite assumption. But either in either direction, I think it's sort of interesting the choice of not really talking about that very much. And I wondered sort of how purposeful that was, and what kind of thought you put into that. Because I guess for me, when I think about the future going downhill in whatever direction it goes in, part of that for me is further racial racial tension. And this seemed like an erasure of racial tension. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, the short answer is it was deliberate, but that doesn't mean it was good or, or the right decision to make. I don't say that flippantly. I, I, I mean it. Um, so I was, I was, in the context of, of the character's identity and all aspects of the character's identity, I would cognizant of there being a space and a negative space. Um, and what I mean by that is this notion that, um, I was talking about this earlier, I think yesterday, um, you know, I'm, I'm a brown Muslim immigrant living in, in Donald Trump's America. And I have a lot of things to say about being brown and being Muslim and being immigrant. I also have opinions about taxes. And I also have opinions about a wide variety of things that don't relate directly to my identity or my perceived identity or what I'm expected to sort of talk about by either this country or the society I'm in. And so, what I want is both of those things. 
I want to, the right to speak about who I am and my identity as much as I want, and also a right to speak about every other facet of my experience of this world. And so this relates to, for example, Surratt's um, sexuality. She never explains it, she never justifies it, she never spends time talking about it, she does what she does, and she is who she is, and she is in that space. And she occupies it, but she also occupies the negative space. So I was thinking about that a lot, because when I was writing the book, I had recently, only recently moved to America, and I was trying to wrestle with this notion of, of I was right, I wrote an op-ed about it, and, and I wrote this one line about this idea of, before you can make anything of this country, you have to figure out what this country makes of you. And so, you know, I was Muslim almost my entire life, essentially. I'm Arab my entire life. I wasn't brown until I got here. And I'm trying to figure out what that means, like capital B, brown, what does that, um, especially since I can pass for anything, right? Um, and, and so I was trying to get at that line, and I think I fell off the tight rope many times in both directions. But I was really, really cognizant of this notion of you get both sides. You don't get compartmentalized in this, in this one space of who you are. If you want to be, if that's where you want to spend your time, that is where that is allowed and that is yours and you, you define who you are. And if you want to speak about anything else, you do as well. So that shapes the sort of extent to which I talk about people's race and sexuality and other aspects of their identity in the book. I don't know that I did it right. Um, and I do know for a fact that I, there's places where I veered far too much in one direction or the other. Um, and those are my feelings as a writer. Those aren't, that's not something I could pin on the society or pin on anything else. That was just me trying to exercise a certain kind of way of looking at things and being new at it and not knowing where that line is. Um, with respect to race as it's dealt with in the book, I think if this was a literal account of a second American Civil War, it would be, the vast majority of it would deal with race. Um, there are parts of the book in which I tried to deal with the idea of racism and the stubbornness, that kind of inherent stubbornness behind racism by form of analogy, and that was another failing. Um, there was the sort of climate change as an analogy to something that many years from now, when it's safe to do so, we'll all be able to stand up and say, I can't believe they didn't realize how wrong they were back then. If it was me, I would have done something about it. Ignoring that this wasn't a temporary moral aberration, that it was the fuel behind a massive commercial empire and a massive empire of self-interest. I didn't intend climate change to be taken as literally as it was in this book. I knew that it was gonna be the defining conflict of the next 100 years, but there are times at the beginning of the book, for example, where this, this person comes to meet the chestnuts, he comes across the river, and he's this guy who's living off the inherited wealth of his parents and grandparents of fossil fuel car dealerships. These are things that have now been outlawed, and yet even though they've been outlawed, this guy lives a very comfortable life off of that inherited wealth. That wasn't me necessarily trying to talk about climate change. Um, but again, it was clearly a failing of mine as a writer because nobody has ever come up to me and said, oh, climate change as, as an analogy for race, I really liked how you did that thing. That's, and that's not a failing of any reader, that's my failing as a writer of trying to, that was ambitious, and that was beyond my capacity to make it work. So that's where I was coming from on that issue. This is going to be the last question. So first of all, I'd just like to say, Thank you for saving the pet turtle. <laughs> I really liked that part. <laughs> um, but my question is about Surat. I was wondering, so throughout the whole war, every um, rebel, every fighter, every, you know, assignments with his gang of rebels, they were all male. And Surat seemed to be the only female fighter other than I know that there are some of the ones who, you know, um, um, were bombing themselves, and, but she was seen to be the only real person who picked up a gun, the only female that picked up a gun, and how do you decide to make her, I mean, character, not Simon, or, you know, how, how, is it, how did it become a female? Well, thank you for that. I, there were a number of reasons for, for centering Surratt 
as a character. One of the things is that I never really thought of her as a fighter, per se. And the fighters in the book are predominantly men, um, as is the case in almost every conflict that I've ever covered personally in, in that sort of situation. Um, the idea of someone who wants to fight, right, as opposed to a fighter, someone who's ca who has the capacity to fight. That's a, that's a distinction that, that's important to me. Um, I, there were a number of reasons for centering this female character, one of which is that a lot of the book has to do with extremism and radicalization. And in the real world, when we talk about that, we almost exclusively talk about it through a male prison. And I wanted to get away from that. Um, particularly since a lot of the book is about the emotional component of this. And that gets buried a lot of the time, and I'm not sure why, but it does. Um, the other part of it is that, um, I mean, all, so I, I, I get asked about the gender of the central character a lot. To the point where I, at one point, went back and looked at my previous, I wrote three novels before this. Um, they weren't any good, I never showed them to anybody, but they exist. Um, and I've written a number of short stories in a manuscript uh, since American War. And I went back and looked at a lot of these things to figure out if I was doing this. Um, and I was, I was doing it quite often. Um, I think, I think it has to do with the fact that the, 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 all the most sort of emotionally resonant experiences of my life have come from the women in my life. And so when I go to fiction, emotionally resonant is where I want to be all of the time. And, and sort of it naturally leads me in that direction. Um, this might be a function of the sort of guys I hang out with, but I've never sort of mined the emotional motivations of a man and not ultimately been somewhat disappointed by what I found. Um, and I mean, also, I, I don't want to discount this either. I was just sick of reading stories about straight white guys. Some of my favorite novels are about straight white guys, don't get me wrong, but, but, but it's... I've read that a lot, um, and it would be disingenuous for me to say that that wasn't a factor in my thinking, because it was. None of that excuses the fact that I'm writing fundamentally outside of myself, and any time you do that, there's going to be an inherent wrongness. There's going to be an inherent distance that you can't bridge. And I don't know if I had the right to do that. I don't know if I did it well. I know I screwed it up in a number of settings. Um, that's an open question for me of how far outside of myself I'm going to write. But for the purposes of this novel, once Surratt showed up, it was going to be her book, um, and everything else was going to take a backseat to that, for better or worse. Um, I've been told that was the last question. Um, I'm, I'm sticking around for a long time. Please come and see me afterwards if you want to chat. Um, thank you so much for your patience, everyone. I really, really appreciate it.